In this video, I'll be going over 10 bosses who made fantastic final bosses of their raids, as well as just some general fun facts about the bosses, since this is basically an opinion-based video, and I'd rather have more to say than just, this boss was cool, because he was. And for this list, any final boss from any raid is fair game, even if they were the only boss in their raid. Now let's get started. Energy. Power. My people are addicted to it. A dependence made manifest after the Sunwell was destroyed. At number 10, we've got Kael'thas, the final boss of Tempest Keep. Kael'thas is iconic, lore important, an OP hero in Heroes of the Storm, and has a memorable boss fight with a lot of really unique mechanics, like dropping a bunch of legendary that the raid could pick up and use to counter the raid's mechanics. Being one of Illidan's right-hand men and the leader of the Blood Elves, he was a much-anticipated fight in the expansion, mainly because he was kinda an anti-hero in Warcraft 3, and then became a straight-up villain in the Burning Crusade. Now let's go over some fun facts about Kale. Kael'thas' raid fight was buggy. Like, really buggy. Today, when a boss has an encounter-breaking bug, it's usually fixed within a few hours of being reported, or at the latest, a week later, like recently with Mythic Kel'jaeden. Kael'thas went months, though, being literally unkillable. In fact, Kael'thas is 11th on the list of raid bosses that took the longest to kill taking 31 days before the first kill, after guilds were able to actually start working on him. His bugs include adds from the first phase building aggro on healers while dead, the legendary shield having a too long cooldown to counter pyroblast, one of the adds teleporting to random players and one-shotting clothies, with the only way to prevent it being to farm this one special herb to take less damage, and this one mob spawning invisible void zones, and the only way to counter was just to keep moving until you stop taking damage. And after all of those bugs are fixed, only five guilds managed to down him because he was still considered too hard. So Blizzard had to nerf pretty much everything again to make it killable by normal people. And then one more nerf later on to make it killable by everything. Little lore fact, Kael'thas was the first leader of the Blood Elves after Arthas destroyed the High Elven Society in the Sunwell. In an attempt to find a new source of power to replace the Sunwell, he joined up with the Alliance and nearly got himself and all of his people killed because of Alliance racism. So if you ever wondered why Blood Elves are a horde race, it's because they tried to work with the Alliance, and it almost got them killed. He eventually joined up with Illidan when the Nagas helped him escape, and he was part of every single campaign in the Warcraft 3 expansion, except the ones dealing with Thrall. So he was a pretty important guy in lore. Kael'thas wielded the sword Fela Malorn, the Fire Mage artifact weapon, before losing it in Northrend. Kael'thas doesn't actually die in Tempest Keep, and reappears later on in the Burning Crusade, this time as the end boss to a dungeon. Kael'thas is the only raid boss to be the end boss of two different instances in the same expansion. And finally, Kael'thas appears as a playable character in Heroes of the Storm much like a lot of iconic Warcraft lore characters, and is arguably one of the best casters in that game. I will hang your broken bodies from the gates of this foundry! At number 9 we've got Blackhand from Blackrock Foundry and Warlords of Draenor. Now, people may complain about WAD all the time and make it seem like it was the worst expansion ever and everything in the expansion was just garbage, but really, the content we got was fine. It's just, there was very little content, so people got sick of it quickly. But the raids were not really part of the problems of the expansion. Blackrock Foundry is probably one of the best raids ever made. Hellfire Citadel is pretty high up there as well. Blackrock Foundry bosses take three spots in my top 10 most unique boss fights video, including the number one spot with Throgar, and it has an amazing final boss as well. Blackhand has an amazing room you fight in, that progresses with him destroying the floor for each phase change, a mechanic that carried over to Legion and is used in Avatar. You start off in pretty standard boss room with him breaking through the floor to show his army waiting for you underground, ready to take you out. So you have to go up and take out the gunners while dealing with the fire and siege engines. Once you push him far enough, he breaks the floor again and you fall down into the lava pits. The look and feel of this final level is top tier, and his difficulty was worthy of being a final boss. Now some fun facts with Blackhand. 
Black Hand from our timeline was the first leader of the Horde, and led the first invasion of Azeroth in Warcraft 1 before being killed by Orgrim Doomhammer, who nearly led the Horde to a complete victory in Warcraft 2, but pretty much lost the war himself to deal with Gul'dan's betrayal. Alternate Draenor Blackhand was second in command of the Iron Horde, and killed Orgrim Doomhammer and Talador, kind of reversing their fates. In the ending cinematic of the Zone of Talador, Blackhand is seen fighting three major lore characters at once, and winning! killing one of them, as well as surviving an explosion strong enough to destroy his flagship. And finally, Blackhand is the only warlord to actually appear as a final boss of a raid in Warlords of Draenor. All the others are killed as early bosses in other raids and dungeons, randomly in quests, or are saved by us and help us kill Archimon for no reason. Have you forgotten your humiliation on the broken shore? How your precious High King was bent and broken before me. At number 8 we've got Gul'dan from the Nighthold. This is probably the most recent boss fight that will appear on this list, being part of the previous raid as of making this video. But his fight is pretty wonderful. You fight Gul'dan on the top of a building as he tries to channel Sargeras' soul into Illidan's body. And all you try to do in the fight is stop that from happening. You'd think, since Gul'dan is a frail old caster, you'd just deal with adds all fight while he hangs back and casts spells. And that's pretty much exactly what he does at the start, until he decides to hulk out and take you on himself. Then, during an intermission, a portal to a demon world is opened and sucks everyone towards it, until Khadgar steps in to help. And once you finally beat Gul'dan, Ilden takes his body back and lands the finishing blow in a cinematic. Gul'dan is one of the few raid bosses to have his death shown in a cinematic immediately following his defeat in the fight. And everything about it just looks good. He is an excellent final boss. Now for some fun facts about Gul'dan. Mythic Gul'dan is one of the few fights with an extra phase in its mythic version, with Illidan's body coming to life when Khadgar attempts to return Illidan's soul to it. So you have to beat the dark soul out of his body before Khadgar can put Illidan's soul back into it. Our timeline's Gul'dan's skull was used in Illidan's first transformation into a demon, and used by Khadgar to close the Dark Portal after the Second War. So it's kind of fitting that both of them are involved in killing alternate timeline Gul'dan in the raid, and the reason Illidan looks at the skull for a moment before he crushes it. Gul'dan being a super important lore character is the hero for the Warlock class in Hearthstone, as there's probably no more iconic Warlock than Gul'dan. He also appears as a playable character in Heroes of the Storm, just like all the Hearthstone heroes except Anduin. At number 7 we've got Onyxia, the original dragon boss and what all dragon bosses since have been modeled after. In WoW anyways, she might have had her abilities modeled after dragon bosses from other games. But a few things were made standard with Onyxia. Breath ability from the front meant you couldn't stand anywhere near her front, a tail sweep from the back meant you couldn't stand close to her tail. So melee DPS had to basically stick to her shoulders to avoid damage, and this is pretty much the same for all dragon bosses since. Someone who set a standard for dragon bosses, and is probably the most well-known dragon boss, has to appear on a list of magnificent bosses. Plus her lair was awesome, it was really fitting the whole go into a dragon's lair to kill them vibe. Now some fun facts about Anixia. Anixia is the most used boss in the game. She appears four different times throughout the game as a killable boss. The first as the original level 60 raid, the second with the remake of the raid in Wrath of the Lich King, a third time as a memory in the TOC dungeon, and finally a fourth time in Blackwing Descent as a zombie dragon alongside her brother. Anixia was the very first ever raid boss killed in World of Warcraft, with the first kill taking place on January 28th, 2005. Killing Anixia was required in order to kill the Nil and Nefarian. Not because of a quest or some other in-game gating, but because of her scales, which were used to craft a cloak that would prevent you from being killed by a certain death dot mechanic. A dot that hits so hard it still killed players two expansions later and 20 levels higher, who tried running the old raid without the cloak. But in order to skin Onyxia, you needed a special skinny knife or a special sword. These were the only two items in the game which could give you plus 10 to skinning, and combined with a skinning enchant, 
would finally allow someone to skin the boss. But both of these items drop from high level dungeon bosses, so simply being able to skin Onyxia was a hassle. Just like everything else in Vanilla WoW. Mortal insects! You dare trespass into my domain! Your arrogance will be purged in living flame! At number 6, we've got Ragnaros. Both of them. Vanilla Rag was the end boss of the first full raid in Vanilla, and he was a giant fire monster you fought at the bottom of Volcano. Everything about that is magnificent, and he was hard for the time. Cataclysm Ragnaros really had some tough shoes to fill. Iconic boss fight returning, it could be really easy to screw it up and make people hate the fight instead. But Blizzard blew it out of the water. Cataclysm Ragnaros is widely considered one of the best boss fights in the game. And the heroic version was in my video of the hardest raid bosses of all time. Taking over 500 attempts before the first kill was achieved. And is one of the longest boss fights as well, since on heroic mode, an entirely new fourth phase is added to an already long boss fight, which could make it last about 15 minutes on average. So cool boss, cool place to fight them, both Molten Core and the Firelands have amazing aesthetics and very long and hard boss fights. Now let's get into some fun facts with Ragnaros. Ragnaros is a hero available on Heroes of the Storm. One of his abilities basically turns you into a raid boss for a bit, and allows you to stay in one position and hit people from a crazy far range. While there are other raid bosses in Heroes of the Storm, none of them feel like you're playing a raid boss like playing Ragnaros does. There's a mini version of Ragnaros in game called Little Ragnaros. This battle pet is one of the few pets in the game who can be used as a cooking fire. It's also tied with the Red Cricket on having the highest attack power value in the game for a battle pet, making it a very hard hitter and one of the better pets in the game. The Ragnaros version in Hearthstone is one of the best legendary cards in the classic set, and was eventually moved to the Hall of Fame for being too good. The same cannot be said for a lot of the other bosses on this list who also have Hearthstone cards. Ragnaros also has a holy version called Ragnaros the Light Lord, with its flavor text being what happens when you try and corrupt a corrupted Fire Lord? Double negative insect. Seeming to imply that corrupting something that was already corrupted causes the two negatives to even out and made him positive. You are already dead. At number five, we've got Cthune. Cthune is the very first old god we fight in game, and he was an extremely hard boss. So hard, in fact, that many people incorrectly think he was the hardest boss fight ever. No, that honor goes to someone else. You see, Cthune was just buggy and overtuned. So overtuned that a player did the math and showed that even if you had a full raid group of everyone with the best possible gear in the game who did everything perfectly, you still couldn't kill Cthune. Since this was vanilla WoW, Blizzard didn't fix the fight until months later, and it was killed within hours of its hotfix. Now, what makes Cthune a great final boss? Well, he has a super cool design and is an old god. All the old gods are super cool. Now, some fun facts with Cthune. Lore-wise, Cthune was defeated by a band of adventurers, being one of the first times the player characters in game are given credit for a boss kill. Usually, some major lore character is tied to the kill, like how Thrall is the one who beat Deathwing and we are just credited as helping him in the aspects. Cthune had an exploit that could be taken advantage of to stay in his stomach room forever. If you had the non-combat pet the disgusting oozling, it would put a little nature resistance debuff on you. So if you summoned it and dismissed it over and over, you could actually fill up your debuff bar and just make the stomach damage debuff go away. The only thing that kept this exploit from being taken advantage of on a large scale was that the oozling was incredibly rare and expensive so not many people had one or could get one. Cthune as a Hearthstone card is the only card in the game with multiple cards directly supporting him and only him. 16 cards in fact. To add to that, there is no other card in the game with direct support, making Cthune unique in that he's powerful enough to have a whole archetype based around him in a game where archetypes aren't even a thing. Not even the other old gods have direct support like Cthune despite them also being in the game. Unleash the tides 
of doom. Upon all those who would oppose us. At number four, we've got Illidan. His boss room is great, super dark and ominous, at the top of the building called the Black Temple, and you can even see Azeroth in the sky. Any boss room that makes for great screenshots is a win in my book. His fight was pretty difficult in its time, but it's pretty simple by today's standards. Being the main character on all the promotional material for two different expansions, it shouldn't be too surprising he'd show up on the list. And you can even do his boss fight from Illidan's point of view during a quest in Legion. But why did we fight Illidan anyway? Wasn't he just a good guy all along? Well, no, not really. He did do a lot of bad things. For anyone who bothered to read the Illidan novel, it does a good job of explaining what happened in TBC from Illidan's point of view. And he was more akin to an evil dictator who told everyone what to do and would do anything in his power to accomplish his goal. His goal just happened to be an ultimately good one. He enslaved people to do his work, he used tons of people's souls to power his portals, he'd do anything for more power, and the reason he told Lady Vash to steal the water in Zangamarsh was to later be used as a tool to force people to join him. But then in Legion we have a whole quest line in which we're told Ilden was really just a good guy all along and we should feel bad about killing him in TBC. Except this is all told through the Naru Zera's point of view, and she's kind of an asshole. If you watch the cinematic in which he tried to force her will onto Illidan and turn him into the Chosen One, he resists and kills her instead, saying that people should do things on their own and not rely on stupid fantasy trope prophecies and Chosen Ones. That all being said, uh, if you never read the books and only did the quest line to get Illidan's soul back, which I'm pretty sure most of the WoW community falls into this category, it's easy to assume Blizzard was trying to say, oh, Illidan was actually a good guy all along, and it was just a big mistake that you killed him in BC. But really, that's just the Naru being a dick. Illidan knew what was happening, he just didn't take the correct steps to avoid a confrontation with the people. All of his planning was in secret. He didn't want people to know about any of his demon hunters or his portals, and he had demons working directly under him, and probably had tons of spies in his mist. Hell, most of his top advisors didn't know his plans, and he even kept his demon hunters in the dark most of the time. His number one enemy was Kill Jaden himself, and Kill Jaden is well known for deceiving loads of people and having an eye on everything that goes on. It's totally understandable that Illidan was cautious about his secrets getting out, and that's why we fight him in the Burning Crusade. On the outside, all we see is all the terrible stuff he does. Illidan knew this and just assumed he'd be able to deal with any problems that might arise and take out the Legion by himself with his demon hunters. But he failed, and just kinda got lucky that Anaru took his side and convinced the people that his end goal was worth working with him. And that's why we have him back in Legion, and why we still see him doing questionable things like forcing a portal open to Argus and killing a prime Naru. His methods have always been unorthodox, but his end goal remains the same. I'd also highly recommend people actually read the Illidan novel. It's very well told and probably one of the best Warcraft books out there. And it does a really good job of retconning a lot of Illidan's lore to make it fit more naturally into the story and kind of make sense. My people should have taken this world long ago during the first war, but they fell to corruption. In their weakness, they allowed the pitiful races of Azeroth to join the Horde. I will succeed where they have failed, and no power in this world can stop me! At number three, we've got Garrosh. Garrosh's raid fight is probably one of the best designed final fights in the game. Multiple phases doing different things with a hard but fair difficulty, and a bonus stage for his hardest mode. Plus, Garrosh himself is just an excellent villain. In fact, did Garrosh even do anything wrong? Wasn't it really all of Thrall's fault? I have a pretty popular April Fool's video on my channel that argues this point and I get comments every day with people saying a variation of, man, maybe Garrosh wasn't so bad after all. No, he was pretty bad, but he had what he thought of as a noble goal. 
and he did everything in search for that goal. And a super good voice actor. I won't let my people starve to death in the desert. I will stop at nothing, nothing, to ensure a proud and glorious future for the orcs and anyone with the courage to stand with us. We will survive because we must. The Horde will prevail. Our suffering is at an end. When this war is won, our people will see prosperity at last. Do you remember nothing of honor, of glory on a battlefield? You who would parley with the humans, who allowed warlocks to practice their dark magics right under our feet. You are weak. We are the Orcish Horde, the true Horde. We die, bloody and thrashing on the field of battle, like true orcs should. You are an orc no longer, and speak for none but yourself. You betrayed our people to forge your fragile alliances, and I will take great pleasure in tearing them apart. So, you wish to face off against a real orc war chief. So be it. I, Garrosh, son of Grom, will show you what it means to be called Hellstream. We are the Horde. We are slaves to nothing and no one. The old god is laughing, toying with us. Who will be our hope? Who will stand and face Yon Saron? At number two, we've got Yog Saron, the second old god we got to fight in game. And he's every bit as memorable and powerful as Cthulhu. Well, maybe even more so. Yog Saron is the final boss of possibly the best raid ever made. Old War is still used as a benchmark to this day as what a good raid should be like. And the final boss is no letdown either. His fight on the hardest difficulty with no keepers helping was nearly thought to be impossible until a Chinese guild was able to down it with a complicated kiting pattern on the ads. And the boss fight in the room really fit the theme. You're not fighting to kill an old god, but to merely push him back down into his prison. And being an old god, just looking at him can drive you mad and turn you against your own men. Now, let's get into some fun facts with the big old one. Yog saron with zero keepers was first obtained through an exploit. While inside the brain room, a healer could grab aggro on the ads outside and cause them to evade. So if a holy pally went in and just threw on their old threat buff that was supposed to be used by their tank spec, they could grab aggro on all of the adds and make the last phase of the adds a cakewalk. Some guilds tried to justify this exploit by saying it was impossible to deal with the adds in the last phase at the current gear levels, until the Chinese guild posted their kill video. Yag Saron and Hearthstone was one of the most overpowered cards in the game's history, really living up to its old god name. When put into play, it would cast a number of random spells on random targets on the battlefield, equal to the number of spells the player had cast that game. Playing Yogg was pretty much a guaranteed board wipe, and could easily swing a losing game into a winning one. If you were really lucky, just win it for you on its own. Eventually, Yogg was nerfed to stop casting spells once he himself was destroyed on the field. So with this clause put into play, it severely limits what he's able to do and is no longer just straight up overpowered. Yogg may not have had a ton of support cards like Cthulhu, but that's because he didn't need them. Serenite Ore, the go-to ore for Wrath of the Lich King, is the blood of Yogg Saron and super dangerous. So dangerous, in fact, the Lich King used his own mindless ghouls to mine it so he could use it to build his citadel. But even the mindless ghouls would eventually start muttering the name of yogg -Saron after a while. This just goes to show that yogg -Saron is so powerful, prolonged exposure to small parts of his blood are enough to drive mindless beings insane.
Ah, my son. You no longer need to sacrifice for your people. You no longer need to bear the weight of your crown. I've taken care of everything. And at number one, we've got the Lich King. This really shouldn't surprise anyone. He's probably one of the most popular bosses ever, and a great example of a final raid boss. The Lich King was hyped up forever and is the only character the average player who knows nothing about lore knows about. His story is well told and he's a real threat to the world. Plus his cold and cocky demeanor and how he taunt players throughout the whole expansion really helps build him up as a person to defeat. Plus, just everything about the raid lore and dialogues leading up to the Lich King is just so well done. And when you finally manage to beat him, he kills the whole raid to show he was just messing with you the whole time. I don't think any other boss in the game has done that before or since. The raid is cool looking, the final boss room is ominous, and the fight is insanely hard. Another one of those that was in my top 10 list of the hardest raid bosses. And he even joins the ranks of the few raid bosses with a cinematic that plays on his death. Everything about him just makes him a magnificent final boss. Let them come. Frost hungers. Now for some fun facts about the Lich King. The Lich King was such an iconic and loved villain that he was in the cinematic and all of the promotional materials for Heroes of the Storm. Being one of the first characters added to the game to be used as a selling point should tell you a thing or two about his popularity. The Lich King is both a card, boss, and playable character in Hearthstone. In lore, while the Lich King may be strong, his power lies more in his unstoppable army of zombies. For example, if he were to battle Lei Shen, the Thunder King, in a one-on-one -on -one battle, he would lose. Lei Shen is just crazy strong. But if they were to let their armies battle each other in addition to them fighting, the Lich King would win. It is speculated the only reason, lore-wise, that we were able to kill the Lich King is because of the Frozen Heart quest chain. During the quest chain, you help locate Arthas' heart that he tore out when he first became the Lich King and destroy it. Lich King is shown to be extremely weakened after the heart is destroyed by Tyrion. So weak in fact that he just runs away instead of killing everyone in the room like he had originally planned. At the end of the raid fight, Bolvar takes up the mantle as a new Lich King to keep the remaining Scourge in check. What this means is that both Arthas and Ner'zhul never release the full might of the Scourge on the world, and probably could have whenever they wanted to. There are many theories as to why they kept them in check, with probably the most plausible theory being that he wanted the Horde and Alliance to send their best champions after him, to have a super elite undead army. But ultimately, it's still a mystery, lore-wise. Gameplay-wise, if he did release his full army of undeads, there would be no game because he would have won easily. The first heroic kill the Lich King got taken away because of a bug that made one of the phases easier. You see, for some reason, the engineering item Serenite Bombs, when used, could regrow the outer platform. Rogues would use them as part of their normal rotation, so they claimed to not know why the platforms would regrow, but they just did. And what this did was make it so they could pretty much just ignore the Valks, who would come down and grab a player and drag them off the platform. Instead of spending valuable time CCing and DPSing down the Valks to save the player, they could just ignore it and let the Valk take them to the edge of the regrown platform and just set them down gently, completely removing a mechanic from the fight. And there was a lot of controversy with this bug. After all, the guild claimed they had no idea what caused the platforms to regrow. And after their temporary ban was over, they went back in and got to kill the Lich King again. But not before another guild managed to steal away the legit world first kill. <laughs> 